All right, uh, today is topic 22. Uh, we're talking about linear algebra. Now, linear algebra is one topic in our curriculum, but it is pretty much an entire semester worth of work in like a college for at college. Um, so there's a lot in linear algebra, but I'm gonna just highlight what are the main things that we as data scientists need to know and also what are the things that are going on under the hood. Uh, so part of today, we're gonna talk about why linear algebra um, explain some of the data types, which are um, NumPy arrays a lot. There's gonna be a little bit of repetition from when we first talked about NumPy arrays back in phase one. Uh, we're gonna talk about some vector and matrix uh, operations, talk about linear equations, and then do a linear regression with linear algebra. So a little preview before we get to that. Um, stats models and uh, scikit-learns linear regressions. If you, anyone ever compared the numbers, I know that uh, stats models doesn't give you very many decimal places for your coefficients, um, but they both solve linear regression in two different methods. Um, the method we're gonna talk about today, linear algebra, is how stats models solves linear regression. And then tomorrow when we talk about gradient descent, that's how scikit-learn solves for your linear regression. So if anyone has ever compared the coefficients, I know like when you go to like the four, five, six decimal places, um, the numbers are a little bit different and that's just because they're using two different methodologies of solving linear regression, one of which we will talk about at the end of this notebook. All right, um, as usual, any questions, feel free to interrupt me and let me know. Okay, so first off, why linear algebra? Um, linear algebra is the basis of many machine learning models. Anytime you're thinking in higher dimensions, and by higher dimensions, I mean like uh, if you're looking at multiple features, um, because each feature can be like a dimension, can be thought of as a dimension, you are actually using linear algebra because linear algebra is what allows you to do calculations across many different dimensions all at once. And to our naked eye, we can only see up to 3D, uh, but through linear algebra, you can go as many dimensions as you need or as you want. So first of all, data is already kind of set up into a matrix by default. We talked about matrices um, when we talked about NumPy, any 2D, um, array is a matrix. And so by default, a lot of our data is set up in table form or in like what you can call a matrix form with rows and columns. So um, because of that, it's very easy to perform linear algebra operations on table form data, which is really, really helpful for us. Um, we're gonna get to language next phase, but um, anything that is in multiple dimensions can be represented using linear algebra and one of those things is language. Uh, we're going to talk about these. These are actually really, really cool uh, ideas. These are known as word embeddings and we'll talk about that next phase. Uh, but they're also represented as vectors and matrices as well. And something that you can get out of that is relationships between different words within language. So for example, um, I'm going to talk super, super briefly about this, but we'll get to this next phase. Um, man to woman is analogous to king to queen, right? Because male to female. And within the whole realm of linear algebra and like multidimensional space, the movement from the point of man to the point of woman is very similar to the point of king to the point of queen. So you can see these lines are like kind of parallel and we'll get to talking about what those are in the next phase. So same verb tense can also be represented by vectors and matrices as well as well as things like country capital, different relationships. Um, this gets pretty high level, uh, but we will talk about those when we talk about uh, natural language processing in the next phase, which is super exciting, very, very cool. Um, another use case of matrices and um, the higher dimensional, I think we talked about this back in phase one, uh, but the use of matrices and tensors, uh, actually image data. Image data is represented as matrices or tensors. So if you had like a black and white image like we have over here, um, every pixel is a data point or every pixel is a feature that has a value. So if you ever tried to process an image, which we will also in phase four, um, each pixel is represented by a number and the number represents its intensity of color. So here in this little snippet, I don't think these numbers actually match up, but the higher number, the darker shade of gray it is, and you have an image, the number of pixels is just the number of 
numbers that you have that represent the image. And when you get color images, it's actually layers of matrices. So here we have a black and white image, so it's just different shades of gray and different intensities of the gray. Uh, but when you have a color image, you actually have one red layer, one green layer, and one blue layer, all with different intensities that make up a color image. So super cool. Um, and yeah, we'll get to that in phase four as well. Um, also, one of my favorite things to talk about, recommendation engines. Um, also in phase four, a lot of these topics will come back in phase four. Um, recommendation engines and what some of the top algorithms for recommendation engines are using linear algebra as well. And we we'll actually, um, when we get to it in phase four, we'll actually walk through that algorithm and how, um, and it's all matrices, super cool stuff. So Netflix actually uses a derivative of, um, a derivative of a linear algebra model. So super cool. And finally, this is a funny meme that I saw. This is pretty much, I feel like how our program does it a little bit. Uh, we go from like statistics and we skip all of the math and we go straight to secular linear model, import linear regression uh, without really understanding what's happening behind the scenes. So when we're doing our linear regression, and of course we're gonna talk about linear regression at the end of this and how this all connects. Um, under the hood of the stats models libraries and, these, and the scikit-learn library that we were using, there is linear algebra and multivariate calculus. So we're gonna talk about linear algebra today, calculus tomorrow. And it'll sort of like uncover what we were doing when we pressed uh, shift enter and let our model fit. Cool. So this is kind of repeated from our uh, NumPy topic, uh, data types for linear algebra. So data types for linear algebra, we use NumPy arrays to represent any linear algebra needed uh, data. So we have scalars, vectors, matrices, and tensors. So first scalar, scalar is just a number. Uh, a vector is an array with magnitude and direction. I'll draw an example later, but you can sort of think of a vector as a one-dimensional array, sort of like a list. Matrices are in 2D and then tensors are in 3D. Um, so I'll go, I'll go through some examples later as well. So remember that these are represented by arrays, not lists. Um, and then as we know, we can use dot shapes to explore the dimensions of these data structures. So if we run this first, you can see that I've defined a bunch of vectors and matrices. This vector of one, two, three, four, five, six is 1D. I think we talked about this as an, at an office hour maybe, I don't remember. Uh, but basically here, because there's only one number, this is a one dimensional vector. As long as it has six one, it becomes 2D. So that's the difference between a 1D and a 2D vector. But here we have a matrix, here we have another matrix. And when you have a matrix, when you have a bunch of matrices together, that forms a tensor. And as we know, because we've done, we've played around with arrays already, you can index any of these the same way as you would nested lists. So, um, so yeah, cool. this I think we don't need to go through as much. Okay, um, let's talk about this for a little bit. Let's talk about vectors, because vectors is something that's gonna come back later on. Uh, because we cannot draw in six dimensions, I'm just going to draw a 2D and a 3D example. So let's just say you have X and Y. So this is X, excuse my janky drawing. Here we have X and here we have Y. Now let's say X and Y are two features of our house. Okay, let's instead of X and Y, let's call it X1 and X2. So this is X2 and this is X1. So let's just say that these are the features of a house. And let's just say this is number of bedrooms, this is number of bathrooms. You can use a vector to represent your data. So let's say a house has three bedrooms, two bathrooms, that point will be over here, because this is three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and we can represent this as a vector that points like this. So this will be our vector representing two beds, three beds, two baths. Uh, you can also do this in 3D if we had like another feature, um, I'm gonna attempt to draw in 3D, but if we had another feature that goes maybe out here and this is X3 and let's say this is like square footage, then I can't draw in 3D, but let's say this has some associated value of square footage and that data point and that vector will represent that, that row of data. So that's vector representation. So if you see a vector like this and it has to be in the context of representing a data point, see something like this, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. That means the value for six features are one, two, three, four, five, and six. 
Uh, that's one way that you can think about it. Cool. All right. So from here, uh, we also talk about the magnitude of the vector. This is something that's used a little less, but can be useful to know, uh, especially when we get to some of the models next week. Uh, you can talk about the magnitude of a vector, which is basically a length of a vector. Um, if this looks kind of familiar, this is basically Pythagoras' theorem. So let's just say I had this vector of 3, 2 that I had earlier. Oops, shouldn't have got rid of that. But let's say I had that 2, 3 vector from earlier that looked like this. All right, let me just redraw everything over here. Let's say we had this 2, 3 vector, the magnitude or the length of uh, synonyms. Uh, it's basically given by the Pythagoras theorem. If this was at three and the other was at two, if this is three, oh, that's janky. Um, but with that, you just, just calculate the length like this. But we don't need to know the formula because NumPy has that built in. So it's just numpy.linalg because there's a linear algebra library within NumPy and find the norm. And norm is the norm is just another way for also uh, representing length. So we have the norm of the vector. So the vector one, two, three, four, five, six has a length of 9.53. Cool. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about, these are just, this is really just me just throwing a bunch of linear algebra terms at you. Uh, and I do know it's a lot, uh, but I will highlight what's most important for us in a little bit. Next is transposing. Now transposing is something that we can do in pandas as well, which is pretty neat. Uh, but if you're thinking about it in a higher dimensional space, uh, transposing just reverses its shape order. So as an example, uh, we have matrix one that looks like this. When we transpose something, it basically turns rows to columns, columns to rows, or some people like to think of it as like flipping it on the X, Y axis, if that makes sense to any of you, but rows to columns, columns to rows. So the rows of one, two, three, four, five, six become columns of one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that the shape reverses. Now, what if you have a tensor? Because tensors are matrices, are um, nested matrices. Um, you also reverse the shape. That's, I will say transposing a tensor is not something that you probably will ever have to do, but something that's, I guess, good to know. Uh, let's say I have this tensor over here, which has a shape of two, four, three, two groups of four groups of three. When you transpose it, it becomes three groups of four groups of two. And you can see that the numbers, they kind of shuffle a little bit. It goes like one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, exactly how this transposes is not important for us, but um, main thing I want to get across when you transpose, it reverses the shape order. So because this is in 3D, which is not something that we have to use very much, um, especially for transposing, it's good to know. All right, um, next we're gonna talk about operations on vectors and matrices. So you can add and subtract vectors. So let's talk about vectors first. Um, for addition and subtraction of vectors, matrices and tensors, as long as the dimensions are equal, the operation occurs element wise. So that means if we have these two vectors, one that is V1, V2, and another that is W1, W2, whenever you, when you do addition and subtraction, it's just by element. Uh, which is actually something that's more that's more powerful about um, numpy arrays versus lists because if you try and add two lists together they just stick the list at the end of each other so if we were to do v plus w and v is 2 4 w is 3 2 v plus w just becomes 2 plus 3 which is 5 4 plus 2 which is 6 and exactly the same for subtraction you can see this becomes negative 1 and 2. now graphically what is happening here a little bit trickier um, and for in some cases, especially when we get to some of the models next week, it's, it helps some people to think about it, but I will admit not everybody. Um, so I'm just gonna explain for the people who it might help. So let's say we have these two vectors over here. Um, this is our axis and our first one is two, four. So two, four, let's put it over here. Um, let's see, this is two, this is four. So over here, we have the vector two, four. Should have made it an arrow. Okay, so this is our vector two, four. When we add vectors together, you can sort of think of it as I have one arrow here and another arrow here, and you just con and you just connect their ends together. So this is the vector two, four. Let me just label it over here, two comma four. 
if I want to add vectors, again, we're just sticking the, the next vector to the end of the first vector. So our next one is three comma two. And so you can sort of see where this addition comes in. Uh, we want to add three over here and then add two over here. So this becomes, what was it again? It was five and six. So when we add the two vectors together, this is what it looks like. Let me just draw these arrows real quick. Okay. So this itself is the vector three, two, because it's going this way three, that way two, going upwards two, right ways three. And so the sum of two vectors, and some people, this is the part that some people, it helps, some people doesn't. Sum of two vectors is this green line over here. So this green line is the five, six sum vector. Um, if you're doing subtraction, you're just flipping it around. So if you're trying to take away this vector amount, uh, all you have to do is take that red arrow, flip it around, and it sort of goes that way, which is how you end up with negative one, two. So that's when you subtract it. Cool. Questions about this? So what would the green line look like in the subtraction? Mm -hmm. The green line in the subtraction uh, similarly just looks like this. So it's so negative one. off the graph, basically. Yeah, uh, technically not off the graph, because I guess right, I going into the like, Yeah, yeah. it goes into negative. Yep, that's right. Anything else? Cool. All right. So this we actually talked about, because I, I know I moved this section into our, uh, when we we're talking about NumPy. Sorry, real that's quick, oh, it, yeah. it's bothering me. So like the second vector, the three, two, if you mm -hmm. did like each one of them individually, right? The three, two, that the vector arrow would still come from the middle for the individual three, two. But Correct. then because we're adding it, you're just adding that slope of it up on top to the, uh, to the first vector. Is that right? Yep, that's, ex that's exactly right. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Now I know that we can undo and erase as well. OK. All right, so broadcasting is something that we talked about last phase, but let's just go over it, uh, go over it again, just so that we know. Um, the thing that makes NumPy arrays more powerful than lists is the fact that it can broadcast, which happens when you perform operations across arrays with different number of dimensions. So what NumPy is doing is it makes a duplicate of the lower dimension array, as long as the higher dimension array contains the same shape. And I'll talk about that again to execute the operation and the order of the dot shape tuple matters. So as an example, here we have our scalar, which we set to four, and we have our vector, which was one, two, three, four, five, six. If we do a vector plus a scalar, it broadcasts that plus four to every element in our vector. Um, you can also broadcast the higher dimensional things. You can do vector plus scalar. I think I have a tensor in here somewhere. So we have a tensor. This, I guess, started at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight you add four to every element. So uh, it will basically make a copy of the lower dimension array, broadcast it to the higher dimension array. Super powerful. I had this exact example in my notebook from phase one as well, but we'll go through it again. Uh, what I mean by the order of the dot shape tuple matters is that let's say I had this um, M1 and V1, and that didn't work. Cause if we take a look at M1 dot shape, M1 dot shape is three comma two. And then if we look at v one dot shape, that's three. Um, if it's smaller and you can sort of see the number of elements, the reason why this doesn't work is we're trying to do um, an array of length three onto a group of onto a group of two element arrays. If that makes sense, so we're trying to force this three onto the two, which did not work. So it says operands could not be broadcast together with those shapes. So what would work? is if we flip this a little bit such that this becomes groups of three, or we can also change the vector such that it becomes groups of two. But now this will work. So broadcasting, something that we use in pandas when we do dot apply, that's pretty much dot broadcasting as well. Um, but yeah, cool. So um, what shapes of matrices and vectors can be broadcast onto tensor two? Basically, whatever subgroups, uh, shape of subgroups that you see. So you can, one, you can broadcast a scalar. You can broadcast any vector of length three. Uh, you can also broadcast any matrix that matches this shape. And of course you can broadcast the same shape tensor on itself as well. Cool. 
questions about this? Awesome. Broadcasting is something that um, we've pretty much been doing. If we're doing any sort of operations on pandas, we are already doing broadcasting. So it's good to know what it's called. All right. So multiplication. Uh, multiplication is a little tough um, because there are different kinds of multiplication when it comes to matrices. So the simpler one, um, the proper name for this simpler multiplication is Hadamard product. And similar to what we were doing with addition and subtraction before, uh, it occurs element wise. So uh, it can only occur between matrices of the same shape or when broadcasting can occur. So let's just say we have these two um, arrays over here. Let me just copy this over, um, np.array. We have this and we just use the star operand to do the multiplication, np.array, we go. And you can see it takes one times three, which is three, two times four, which is eight. Uh, and then the last one is 18, which is two times nine. So that's doing element wise. Um, Hadamard product also counts if you're doing it as a scalar. So let's say we have one, two, one, two, we multiply it by six, multiplies everything by six. So broadcasting is also occurring here. Hadamard product, uh, useful for like data operations, feature engineering. Uh, but what's a little bit more complicated, but more used in the context of linear algebra is the dot product. And I know that dot product um, is used as a term for a couple different things. Um, so I actually kind of call it matrix multiplication, just so you have that distinction in terminology, but also called the dot product. So unless otherwise stated, multiplication if you're dealing with matrices, usually we'll refer to this kind of multiplication. And the math of it is a little more complicated. Um, it's a little tedious as well. Thank goodness we have a built-in function to do that. But what we're doing here is we're gonna take the rows of the first matrix. So the rows of the first matrix being, let me just use some different colors, rows being these, and do an element-wise product with the columns of the second matrix. So let me use another color over here, columns of the second matrix to form this new matrix. So what, this, what we're doing here is you can see this first term that we have in the top, uh, top left corner over here is A11 times B11 plus A12 times B21. So we're taking these two terms, this top row of our first matrix, multiplying it by our first column of our second matrix. So B11, B21, which is what we have over here. Um, I will say I've only been asked this kind of do a matrix multiplication in an interview one time and it was for a very technical like math role. So I wouldn't be too worried about it unless, I mean, this is something that I would say probably study for before like a more um, technical job, but good to know. Um, but yeah. That's what we're doing in terms of the multiplication. For this one over here, you can see that it is the first row with the second column. This is the second row with first column, second row with second column. Uh, it is pretty tedious. It does take a little bit of getting used to. Sometimes I also have to think about, I pretty much always have to draw these lines over here so I can remember myself, um, but yeah. Okay, so Something to note is we're doing the element-wise multiplication between the rows of one and the columns of another. So therefore, there are some shape restrictions. Uh, basically, what has to happen is that the number of elements in each row of the first matrix has to match up with the number of elements in a column of the second matrix. So therefore, number of elements here has to match number of elements in here. So with that rule, what dimensions of A and B, sorry, if the dimensions of A and B are N times N and P times Q, what are some of the shape restrictions? Uh, the shape restrictions are N has to be equal to P because the number of, um, the number of columns in the first one has to match the number of rows in the second one, which I know is very confusing. What I like to do is I write out the dimensions for both matrices and then just check that the middle numbers uh, match and those can be multiplied together. Um, if you have matrices that can't be multiplied together, Python will just throw you in errors telling you something about a shape mismatch. I wouldn't worry too much about the manual computation of this, but questions at this point? 
Okay, so now that we know roughly how it's being done in the back end, we can use the dot product to do it. So here we have just two arrays A and B. We can just do numpy dot dot A comma B, and that multiplies. Uh, there's, I think, a couple different ways to do it. You can also do A, I forget, I think this should also work. Yeah, that also is another way to do it. Um, so yeah, dot product. Um, another thing to note is the order of your multiplication also matters because you're using the rows of the first one and the columns of the second. So the order of which you want to multiply your matrices really does matter. So A times B is different from B times A. And also, yeah, if you group it differently, it's also going to be different. Uh, so if I were to change it and do B dot A, our numbers change. So that's something to take note of because I know regular multiplication order doesn't matter. Okay, um, one last kind of multiplication that we have to talk about, not we have to talk about, um, that just exists, but we actually don't really use it for our purposes, is cross product. So cross product is used for more abstract application of linear algebra. I only have it here because it's somewhere in the curriculum, uh, but to be honest, we don't use it at all, uh, but we'll just define it for vectors. So let's say you have two vectors, A and B, and you can calculate its cross product using this formula over here, where uh, this A and B within like the absolute value signs, is just their magnitude, a uh, sign of the angle between the two vectors multiplied by N, and then N is a unit vector perpendicular to the plane formed by two vectors. What that means is, let's say you have two vectors in space, as long as you have two vectors, and we can think about it in a 3D space, imagine I have two vectors over here, my hands are two vectors, uh, between my hands, you can form a plane. You can just have like a flat surface between that. So that's the plane formed by two vectors. Um, and then N being a unit vector perpendicular, perpendicular to the plane means that that flat surface that we form between the two vectors, um, any, uh, any vector perpendicular to that that sticks in and out of the plane with a 90 degree angle, that is a vector perpendicular to the plane. If that didn't make any sense, that's actually completely fine. Um, and then it also, the cross product of two vectors also has a magnitude or length equal to the area of a parallelogram formed by the two vectors. So if you have the two vectors, again, uh, if we sort of take one vector and multiply it, so let me draw it out, <laughs> here we draw it out. So let's say we have two vectors that look like this. You can sort of form a parallelogram with the two vectors. Uh, they're not gonna be perfectly parallel in my drawing, but this is the parallelogram formed by two vectors. and um, it has the length equal to this area. Uh, it's also perpendicular to the plane formed by these two, two vectors. And when you do cross product, you lose a dimension. Um, all of these are just definitions of a cross product. We pretty much never are going to use this, but it's good to know if you come across like different ways of multiplying uh, vectors and matrices, this might be one of them. Okay, so next division. Uh, you cannot divide matrices. I guess you can multiply by a fraction um, using like a Hadamard product or something like the element wise way. But typically you, you cannot do any uh, ve vector or matrix division. However, you can find the inverse of a matrix. So though it is not possible to divide by matrices and again, broadcasting still works element wise, what we can do is find the inverse of a matrix and when a matrix itself is multiplied by its inverse, and inverse is just denoted by a little negative one superscript, uh, it gives you what is called the identity matrix. Now, what an identity matrix is, oh, actually, before I get into that, order of multiplication doesn't matter for a matrix and its inverse. Both A times A inverse and A inverse times A will both give you the identity matrix. So what is this identity matrix? I like to think of the um, identity matrix as the operational equivalent of one for linear algebra. So basically it is a square matrix with a diagonal of ones moving from left to right and the remaining numbers are zero. So all of these are identity matrices. So you can see here, um, the main diagonal, basically top left to bottom right, all ones, everything else is zero. Um, so here we have, for example, a three by three identity matrix, ones down, this diagonal, everything else is zero. And you can go as high as you want. And if you have any matrix and you multiply it by an identity matrix, because its operational equivalent is one, you'll actually get the same matrix uh, itself. 
So this shows the effect of multiplying by the identity matrix. So first you have just this random matrix X. We have the identity matrix here, which NumPy very uh, conveniently has a NumPy dot identity that creates identity matrices. Um, when I do X dot identity three, it gives us, now it has like a floating point, but same numbers, same matrix. Uh, when, you, when you multiply something by the identity matrix of the correct shape, it gives it the matrix itself. Now, if we take a look at multiplying and multiplying a matrix by its own inverse, um, NumPy also has an inverse method built in, which is really neat. So we can take a look at the inverse of X and X, by the way, is this. So the inverse of X is these, um, these decimals. And when we multiply X by its own inverse, we get an identity matrix. So yes, we have these negative signs, but they're zeros anyways. So we get a diagonal of ones, the rest are all zeros. So when you multiply a matrix by itself, uh, by its own inverse, you get the identity back. And that's gonna be something that's, uh, that we're gonna see is a pretty important quality of matrices. Okay, so those are the main operations on vectors and matrices. Any questions at this point? Okay, um, everything that I've thrown at you so far is like already three weeks of college material. So if this is a lot, I, I hear you. <laughs> All right, so next we're gonna talk about systems of linear equations. So one of the most common applications of matrix operations is by solving these systems of linear equations. So quick sidebar, what are linear equations? Linear equations basically only have linear variables, which means that our unknowns are only multiplied by a scalar and raised to a power of only one. So for example, each of these are linear equations. So let's just say in this scenario, our unknowns are X and Y. Um, so each of our unknowns are only multiplied by a scalar. So here, X is multiplied by one, Y is multiplied by, in this case, I guess, negative two. Uh, for this, because E is a constant number as well, it's a scalar. Pi is also a constant, so it's also a scalar. So this also still counts as a linear equation. What is not linear is here we have x squared because the x, the unknown itself is squared. Um, it is not a linear equation anymore. Also, this is the natural log of y, uh, log transformed y, not linear anymore either. Uh, here, this part is linear, but y raised to the power of x, definitely not linear. Here we have the exponent of x, also not linear, but this part is, but it makes the entire equation not linear. So these are all examples of nonlinear equations. So if you have like a bunch of linear equations, you can actually solve for the unknowns using linear algebra methods. Um, so let's say you have two unknown values and here we have x and y. If you have two unknown values, um, mathematical rule, you need to have three unique equations, sorry, with two, the number of unknowns have to match the number of unique equations describing relationships between the variables. So in this case, we have two unknowns and two equations. Um, if you have three equations, then you might run into issues, but nothing, uh, let's not worry about that for now. But let's just say we have these two linear equations. You can use algebra and like, you know, substitute the X's and Y's to solve this, uh, which is completely valid for solving linear equations. Uh, but you can also use linear algebra methods, which I think some people might have done in like, I don't know, AP high school math, I don't know. But first, to solve these, uh, this system of equations using a linear algebra method, you want to represent these as matrices and vectors. So this is the way that you represent these two equations. Uh, you can sort of see where the numbers come from. So this is kind of our first equation. We have like the one and the negative two. And if you do the matrix multiplication out on the X, Y, it actually, cause you're using the row here and the column here, it actually does work out to X minus two Y. And then here we have the three and the two here. And if you multiply this out, you get the one and the 11. So first you represent these equations as the matrices and vectors. And we're gonna just define this over here. So next you have this whole system of equations here that I'm gonna break down because I think the process is good to know. Um, all right, so here what we have at this stage is a times x equals to b. So a is our matrix over here. This is a. 
we're just going to represent this these unknowns all as x for now and we're just going to call this b this is a and this is b now if you ever if you ever solve some sort of like algebra equation and you want to solve for x what you have to do is isolate x on one side of the equal sign so we're actually going to take the same approach different methodologies so with this, how do we isolate X on its own side of the equal sign? Um, typically in regular algebra, yes, we would divide, divide both sides by A, but because in matrices we cannot divide, instead what we'll do is we're going to multiply it by its inverse, because that is kind of like the equivalent of dividing by itself. So multiplying by the inverse, and remember that the order matters. So because we're adding the inverse on the left side of everything, the A inverse over here also has to be on the left side of the B. And this itself will simplify to I because um, inverse times itself becomes I. And we're just left with this over here. So we just have to solve this part, which we can do in code over here. And we'll find out what the unknowns X's are. So we run this super quick. Oh, everything shifted. Let me clear everything. So. Once you run that, we come out with this array of three, one. And so this x, y is three, one. So x is three, y is one. And let's just double check to see that that is correct. Um, x is three, y is one. So x minus two, y, three minus two is one. And x is three, right? Okay, so x times, three times three is nine, plus two is 11. So x is three and y is one. So just by doing this, which might be a little overkill for this system of equations. Um, we've solved the system of equations using matrix methods. Questions about this process, because this actually scales to how we solve linear regression. Cool, awesome. All right, so next to linear regression, which is what we just did. Uh, so a linear regression can be interpreted as the solution to a system of linear equations. So each observation just corresponds to a linear equation and the coefficients are the linear unknowns that we're solving for. And we're representing each observation as a linear combination of features. So here we have our, oh, I might have to change this data again real quick. This has to be auto MPG. Uh, sorry in advance about your uh, the one the version that I uploaded I don't think has that saved okay so we have our trusty miles per gallon data set and here we're trying to predict miles per gallon we can actually express that as a system of linear equations so each row is going to be a, an equation so let's just say we have let's just use the first one two three four five six to start uh, so let's say we have these six um, these six features. So 18 miles per gallon will be equal to some coefficient times cylinders times some coefficient of displacement, some coefficient of each of these, which is the coefficients that come out when you do your stats models OLS. And that's solving this system of linear equations. And in this case, we have what, um, 392 rows? Yeah, can't believe I remember that. Um, but yeah, so each, uh, observation is a linear combination of features. Uh, and our prediction equation for a linear regression looks something like this. Uh, for those of you who, you who use like dot predict, that's actually how dot predict uh, works. Dot predict is basically taking the coefficient B0, let me zoom in a little bit. B0 is our intercept term. And then you're just taking value. You're taking uh, value times coefficient for the first one, value times coefficient for the second one to come up with your prediction. If we represent it in this matrix form of y equals x plus b, we're solving for b. And let me just draw that out really quick. So we have y, which is our, uh, our target variable, which looks like a one-dimensional long array like that. This is our y. We have our x, which is a, um, a bunch of features, same number of rows. And then we also have b. b is... Uh, the same length as the number of columns, but this is B, and we want to basically solve for B. And so what we have here, and let me just draw it so it's a little clearer. This is Y, this is all our, our X, and B are the coefficients that we're trying to solve for. Uh, 
questions about this setup. And this D is what we want to get. Cool. So we're going to basically do what we did for the system of linear equations to solve linear regression. OK. So to start, let's just define our x's and y's. So now, oh, I think it's because it is model year in this data set. Okay. All right, so apologies for those of you running this, uh, just make those little changes. So here we have our x data frame, and that's what we have over here. Um, this constant part, I actually link an article on like why we have to add the constant later, but we're just going to add this and that basically takes care of the intercept term, the intercept that uh, you get at the top of your stats models OLS. And so X looks like this now. And we just have to solve for B like we did before. And so if we remember from what we had over here, all we had to do was multiply by the inverse of A. And that's how we solve for uh, this X before. So analogous to that, we're going to try and get the inverse of x. However, we run into an error. Let me just clear this away. We get an error that says that the last two dimensions of the array must be square. So we cannot take an inverse of xdf because it just isn't a square. Uh, quick sidebar, we can only inverse square matrices because of some linear algebra theory. Um, quick sidebar. Um, we have something called an invertible matrix with a definition as follows. Anything that is invertible is an n by n square matrix, and there has to exist uh, n by a square matrix B that gives you this result. So basically, um, for something to be invertible, it has to have an inverse. And in, for something to have an inverse, it has to be square. So therefore, by this definition, uh, TLDR, you can only find the inverse of square matrices so with B not being square, how can we solve the system using the data that we have? Um, this actually breaks down to this equation. I'm going to walk through why that is. So there's a kind of a long process, but let me just make these blank cells over here. What we started off with is, let me write these out. What we started off with is Y equals to XB, and we want to isolate B. What we tried to do but couldn't do is we tried to uh, take the inverse of x to isolate b, but we couldn't do that because b wasn't a square. However, we can kind of force x to be a square, or we can try and create a square matrix by multiplying x with its own transpose. So that's what we have over here. We're going to multiply x by its own transpose. So if we go down the process, Let's first take the transpose and multiply it to the left of everything. So we'll have this of x transpose x b. Looks like we made it a little bit more complicated, but this will help in a little bit. Now, what we have over here is a square matrix. And the reason for that is when we're doing our matrix multiplication, let's say we have a matrix that looks like this multiplied by a matrix that looks like this. Your resulting matrix will be a square, just because you know that um, the outer matrices, it is the same matrix just with flipped dimension. So no matter what the order is of your uh, multiplication of transpose and itself, it's always going to end up as a square. So now that we know that x transpose x itself is a square, let me just get rid of these boxes because they're distracting. Um, now that we know that this is a square, you can actually take the inverse of this entire thing. So if we take the inverse of this entire thing and multiply that, which transpose x inverse multiplied by x transpose y, we end up with this long equation that will essentially cancel out. Let me just finish writing all of this. x transpose x b. Cool. Now that you have this long equation, because we added this term over here, actually, let me use it in color. We added this first, and then we added this second. You can see that this and this are inverses of each other, so they cancel out. Cancel out this, cancel out this. B is now on its own. And that is the same as this equation that we have over here. Um, this is something that I've only memorized because I spent years doing this, but not important to you at all. 
um, but just good to know where and how this equation is, is derived. Good to have just seen it for a little bit because it brings back a lot of the concepts that we talked about at the earlier part of this notebook. So all we have to do here is now um, use Python and NumPy to work this equation out. So first I'm gonna take X transpose and transpose is just dot capital T or there's also dot transpose as a method too. Um, and then you can do np.matmol is the same as dot product as well as the same as np.dot. Uh, but you can get the xtx here and this is just breaking up into different steps. But in the end, we end up with b. So cool, now that we have these numbers, these numbers are actually our coefficients, um, which is pretty neat. So what we're gonna do here, I just zipped B with our column name so that we know which one uh, refers to which column. And let's just compare that to our um, scikit-learn results. So here we're running our scikit-learn model and let's just take a look at our coefficients. So if we just zoom out a tiny bit, hopefully y'all can still see. Here are our coefficients. First, our constant, 14.535. You see that this matches up until I think five, six, seven, eight decimal. Oh, actually pretty much matches. Um, and then all of these other coefficients match as well. So here you see that this is the power, uh, is divided by 10 basically. So 0.329, displacement, 7678, 7678 over here. They all match up. Um, so what we're doing in stats models, stats models uses this method to solve for your linear equation, which is pretty neat. Stats model is actually using this uh, formula to solve your linear equation and get your coefficients. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about sci how scikit-learn does it, which is the process of gradient descent, which is a different method of solving the same kind of model, uh, which is also pretty neat. Um, but yeah, just wanted to show that two different methods get pretty much the same numbers, but now we know under the hood how stats models is solving for a linear regression. And this is us just manually uh, manually doing it. Now, um, if you remember the process of doing matrix multiplication, which we had over here, uh, over here, this process is extremely computationally expensive. It's very, very, uh, you can see there's, a lot of computation being done. Our data set that we worked with for our phase two project, maybe like what, 10,000, roughly 10,000 rows and maybe like 10, 20 columns. Um, and most of you, I think the models would run in at most a few seconds. Uh, for those of you who did like dummy variables of like zip codes, if anyone did that, that will take like maybe, it'll take a noticeable amount of time. Um, so the one downside about solving it via the linear regression method is once your data sets get really, really big, this method slows down tremendously. So it doesn't scale very well. Uh, that's a pro and con. Um, that's, a, that's a con. The pro of this is you get your definitely best solution. If you're using the linear regression method, you definitely get the optimal coefficients, uh, which is something that we're gonna talk about tomorrow when we talk about calculus and gradient descent. If you're using scikit-learn, uh, because it's a gradient descent process that we'll talk about more tomorrow. For those of you who got to that section in the pre-work, um, you can see that it will try and get as close as possible to the optimal numbers, just incrementally and slowly. So it's a slow learning process, whereas linear algebra solves it for the exact best value always, given the data. Um, but yeah, that was linear algebra. I have some additional resources here. I will say that um, for data science, machine learning as a whole, the um, gradient descent process is a lot more prevalent versus this kind of process, again, because of the inability for this to scale. Uh, so yeah, use that information how you will. Um, there is a really, really great playlist on that explains just all sorts of linear algebra concepts and some other materials here if you want to know, just read more about uh, some of the little things that I glossed over today. But yeah, any any questions about this? This is basically like a crash course of like at least six, seven weeks of like college linear algebra material in like 15 minutes. So um, happy to answer questions. Let me know. I like, this is probably like my favorite of all the math topics. So if anyone ever wants to talk about it, let me know too. Um, but yeah, 
Any questions regarding this stuff? Sweet. Well, there's nothing else. Tomorrow we'll get into gradient descent and calculus. There is no notebook because I'm basically going to be drawing a lot of diagrams uh, and explaining some in explaining what I'm going to explain tomorrow. Um, so yeah, look out for that. Uh, don't forget to schedule your project reviews. I see some of you here in this call who still haven't scheduled your pro project review, so please do that. Um, and yeah, if there's nothing else, I'm on Slack whenever you need me, and I will talk to you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. <laughs>